Will you stand with me, please? God, 
you use the weak to lead the strong you lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh god your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh god your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me Lift up our eyes to the giver of light. 
He lifts up our eyes, lifts up our eyes to the giver of life. He lifts up our eyes, lifts up our eyes to the giver of life. You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. You alone can rescue, you alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. And you came down to find us, let us out of Yes. 
testimony and everyone overcome Savior worthy of honor and glory worthy of all of our praises you overcame God, you fulfilled both sides of it. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for that. John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, and it said, You are blessed, or no, excuse me, you are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Thank you, Billy. I also want to uh, read this to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I think this is so cool and so fitting with the passage we're talking about in Mark. It says, no test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. It's a pretty cool verse. That's uh, saying he'll never push you past your limits. He'll always be there to help see you through it. 
That's almost like one of those verses you would get tattooed like on your lower back or something. You know, I mean, just one of the, hey, you know what, he's got my back. You, you get it tattooed right there. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, but, but, but I want to speak to you today on the subject of being under pressure as we're talking about March Madness. And, and you know, I know March Madness is all about basketball and, and making it to the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, the Final Four, and, and, and so on. But, but I want to flip the script just a little bit because when we think about madness, we think of chaos and, and, and crazy stuff happening and trials in our lives. And so I want to flip the script a little bit and, and talk about all the chaos in our lives. And, and have you ever noticed with all the chaos, it usually seems like there's a lot of pressure. We seem to be in a lot of pressure. And, and sometimes our lives feel like we are in a pressure cooker and we are just ready for things to start to implode. I, I, I know... We, we, we have those weeks even in our jobs and even in our families. And so today I, I want to talk to you a little bit about being under pressure. How many of you would admit that you have a high pain tolerance? One, two, three, four, five. All right, so I'm talking about fellas because I will be the first to admit I do not have a high pain tolerance. Not one fella in the group today raised their hand saying they had a high pain tolerance. We are a bunch of sissies. That's okay, though, because I thought I did have a high pain tolerance until I watched my wife give birth to my children, and I realized I do not have a high pain tolerance whatsoever at all. And, and, and she's almost like, when I saw it, it's almost like she's like the She-Hulk. I mean, it was just amazing, the strength and, and the, the pain tolerance she had. With our first child that was being born, she said, you know, I'm going to do this all natural. And, and I'm, I'm so scared of this epidural thing. I'm going to do it all natural because I would be the one that something bad would happen to me if, if I got the epidural. And, and, and when we get, you know how it goes. You're in stages, and they number you. And we're getting higher in number, and I'm thinking, dear Lord, just do it. I don't know what it means, but, but seriously, let's do something because the pain, it's killing me to watch you in this pain. Uh, uh, I'm over here, one, two, three, <laughs> let's breathe, let's get some ice cubes, whatever we can do. It's, it's not a matter of showing me how tough you are. I, I believe it, you're tough, we're here. You, you carried a child inside of you, that's amazing. And then it came, go get the epidural. I was like, yes, ma'am. Victory is ours. And so we holler down the hall. I'm like, Doc, hey. He's like, I'll be there. No, you don't understand. Minutes, we don't have minutes. We need you now. We need you now. And here he rolls in with a craftsman toolbox of all things. And, and, and you know, I'll never forget that. He rolls in with this craftsman toolbox and pulls this javelin out of this craftsman toolbox, which I'm pretty sure an epidural is part harpoon. And I think that they just drew a target on her back and heaved this harpoon or javelin. Have you seen the size of those needles? Listen, I asked the lady, I was like, can my father come in and take my place? I, I'm going to need I'm going to need some help because brother's about to go down. I mean, I'm doing this. She's like, is it okay? It's fantastic. Uh, there was a mirror right in front of me, and so I could see this harpoon. And, and, and I thought, oh, oh, sweet Jesus, this has to hurt so bad. And you know, an epidural numbs you, I guess, from the, the waist down. And as I'm standing there watching my wife give birth, and, and I know it's beautiful, but not, I'm thinking, can you give me an epidural in my face? Because... <laughs> I'm showing emotion that probably shouldn't be shown right now, and, and she's looking at me like, you're going to die. And, and so it was, just, it was just one of those weird deals, and I thought an epidural for me would be great. You know, I, I'm the kind of guy that if I walk down the hall and stub my pinky toe, we might want to get a hold of Metaflight because I am really, really hurt. And my pain tolerance just isn't that high. A few years ago, I had a knee surgery, and... And my calf swelled up, and they thought I had a blood clot in my calf. And Listen, I'll admit it, I was in tears crying like a baby, and she's like, oh, my gosh. 
let's just take you to the doctor. Listen, I know I can't have a kid, but I'm just not. I wanted to cut my leg off with the saw. I, my pain tolerance is not that high. But isn't it kind of, uh, wouldn't it kind of be nice? Um, I need to probably go back to my notes here. Sorry. That, that in, in, in life, um, when we go through this stuff and we, we experience pain and, and we experience loss and we experience turmoil and, and, and all these emotional pains or different seasons and, and trials and tribulations that we go through, isn't it funny that life doesn't hand us an epidural to, to kind of numb the pain sometimes? I mean, it just doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't hand us an epidural or anything uh, uh, like that. And, and, and maybe, maybe for you today, you're sitting here, and maybe you're having some problem in your marriage, and your marriage is on the fringe, or, or maybe today you're, you're having some problems with your children, and you're thinking there's not going to be a light at the end of this tunnel. Or maybe you're feeling some kind of emotional pain uh, of, of something today. But, but, but I believe today when we look at what God's Word says, um, this passage that we just read, there's some real relief for you right here. If we'll really take note and, and look at this uh, passage. In, in fact, God, you know, His Word says that He will never leave us, nor He'll never forsake us. As we, we read this text, and Jesus is in the being baptized, he's fixing to go into the wilderness and be tempted by the devil um, for 40 days. What's interesting is what happens right before the temptation or the season of this wilderness. It's, the text says that Jesus walked down to the river where his cousin John was down there baptizing a bunch of people. And he, he said, hey, um, you know, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and get baptized myself. And, and the passage says that John baptized Jesus, and as soon as John baptized Jesus, that the when he come up out of the water, that heaven was torn apart, torn wide open. And that the Spirit ascended on him like a dove. And then, to, I want you to think about being there in this moment. A voice from heaven came down and said this. It said, I want to make sure I read it right. It said, you are my beloved son with you whom I am well pleased. You know, what's interesting is in this moment when the voice or from when God speaks from heaven upon Jesus, he, he says, with you who I am well pleased. As I spoke before we read the passage, Jesus hadn't even done anything up to this point. He hadn't done anything. He hadn't healed the sick or raised the dead or fed the 5,000. There's nothing. He hadn't preached the message yet. He hadn't done anything, but yet the pastor says that he said that with you whom I am well pleased. You know, if it was me, if I was God, I would have done it totally different. I would have done it completely different, this baptismal service for him. It would have maybe went a little something like this. I'd have said, you know what, uh, Jesus, today is your day. Today's your day, man. Today's your day. They, they knew you as just this carpenter boy, but after today, nah, nah. Listen, here, here's how it's going to go down. So John's going to baptize you, okay? And as soon as John baptizes you, um, I want you, when you ascend out of the water and heaven split wide open and the, and the Spirit comes down upon you like a dove, I want you to get on top of the water and I want you to start to moonwalk on top of the water. And then, you know, to make sure that all the attention is on you, I want you to give it a little whip and a nay nay. You know, you know what I'm talking about. I want you to give them a little something, Jesus, because we want the attention to be focused on you. But, but you know, I think, I think we need to really make a grand entrance. And so it go like this. When the voice is going to come down, I'll be like, ladies and gentlemen, you've been waiting thousands of years for this moment. Here is the Son of God. He stands six foot two, 190 pounds. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the Prince of Peace. Everybody give it up for Jesus. That's how I'd have done it if I was God. It would have been something like that. But here's the thing. That ain't how it happened. It didn't happen anything 
like that. No, he just said, you're my son, and with you, I am well pleased. You know, I, I, I wonder what is God trying to tell us through this? What is God saying, maybe right here in this passage? Can I tell you that this this morning, and we talked about this last month a little bit, God's love for us is not based on our performance. Isn't it interesting that God can't love you any more or any less than he loves you right now? Because it, it's the greatest love of all. It, it can't be any more or any less than it is right now. You know, it's not like he's doing this. He's not going, you know what? You know what, Brett? You didn't open your Bible since last Sunday. And, and we're not in kindergarten, and, and God doesn't give us the star system, and you only earned two stars this week. And so my love for you is just not quite where it was last week. No. His love isn't based on our performance. God's love is a love that, that, that's almost unexplainable. It, it's, it's consistent. It's consistently consistent. You know, I can't help but think about my own kids as I read through this text. As many of you know, my youngest child, Taylor, she's quite a little bit of a rebellious one. She kind of beats to her own drum and does her own thing. And my kid, Taylor, has this disease that is called laziness. And, and she doesn't really do the things that I tell her to do all the time. Which in a result means that I'm consistently having to discipline her. I feel like my voice to Taylor is just constantly loud. Because I'm always having to holler at Taylor. You know, she does stuff all the time. Just I think just to see how far she can push my button. Now my attitude and my demeanor changes towards that child but my love never changes I, I might get frustrated my attitude might change but I want to tell you something she's mine she's mine and I'm consistently gonna consistently 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 love her this passage he's not saying hey Jesus listen I want you to show him what's up when you get down there. He says, no, I don't care what you've done. You haven't done anything up to this point besides being known as a carpenter's boy. But I'm going to let everyone know right here that you're mine, which is very interesting because I think sometimes we seem to give sin too much credit and not enough credit for Jesus we seem to sometimes think this mess that we're in you know you know I'm gonna have to clean my life up or get a little things a little cleaner before I start going to his house or I'm gonna have to straighten up a little bit and change my lifestyle before I ever start talking about Jesus and we give sin way too much credit but God not enough credit listen can I tell you today, I don't care what you're going through, he still loves you. He still loves you. He loves you the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He still loves you. And, and, and here's what's crazy. is We haven't even got to the main focus of this passage yet. And, and we, we're building up to that. But, but, I, but I want us to really understand how important this was before this moment was before Jesus ever went into the wilderness. It says that it was so important because, you see, before he ever stepped into the wilderness, he was identified. Before he ever stepped into that storm, God said, you're mine. Before he ever began his temptation process, he said, you're my son. And then it says that the Spirit drove him to the wilderness. That kind of messed me up. 
It says, basically, the Spirit of God took him into the wilderness. That kind of messed me up. Why, why, would, why would God take him to the test? Can I tell you this morning that, that God wants to take you to the test so he can bring you through the test? Because at the end of the test, you're going to have a testimony. Hey, that's good. I don't care who you are. Someone should have said amen right there, and you missed it all. He, 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 gonna, he took him to the test so that when he brought him through the wilderness and the faithfulness of God, he had a testimony. You see, we, we didn't read verse 14, but in verse 14 it says that John had been arrested. And when Jesus came out of the wilderness and he walked into the city, he immediately started proclaiming the gospel and the good news of what God had done in his life. Now, I want to say this today, this morning, some of you are going through a testing season. Some of us are going through a trial. Some of us are kind of in a mess. But, but are you really focusing on how much love Jesus has for you to get you through this test? Because maybe at the end of this test, he wants something to come out of your mouth and you can start talking about the testimony he gave you. I believe Matthew chapter... Well, let me see. I know it's in Matthew... It, it, it talks about this. Is, you know, Satan has been up to the same old trick since the beginning of time. He tries to attack your weaknesses. He, he tries to go for the thing that he can maybe expose the most. Have you ever noticed that he tries to bring up your past and throw it in your face? Or a weakness that you're going through and he tries to bring it up and throw it in your face? And, and then, have you ever noticed, he tries to question your identity? You're like, man, I, I thought I knew God. In Matthew, it speaks of this, it says this, that, that that's the exact same thing Satan did to Jesus. He said, if you really are the Son of God, then you'll turn them to rocks into loaves of bread, because I know you're hungry. The first thing he does. It's the same trick he pulls on us. You know why he tries to question our identity? Philippians 2.10 says this. It tells us that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is is Lord. You know what that name of Jesus means? It means that you have authority. You have authority. And, and you know what's a powerful is that when you accept Christ, you have that authority in your life. And some of us have never done anything with that authority. Listen, I, I, I want to tell you, your, your trial or your situation or your mess that you're in right now, can I tell you this morning it has an expiration date? I'll assure you it has an expiration date. Some of us need to start speaking some authority in those situations and saying, you know what, I'm done with you, Satan, be gone. We need to start taking some control. Listen, God gave us that for a reason. We are the son of the King of Kings. We are the son of the Lord of Lords. We have that authority. God gave us that authority in our lives. But too many times we sit around and we don't do anything with it. You might want to write this down. When you know whose you are, you'll know who you are, and you'll understand and know the authority that who you really, what you really have. When you know whose you are, you'll begin to know who you are. Hey, can I tell you something? I serve the one and only God that's ever died and rose again. Listen, my, my faith is, is pivotable on that moment right there. 
It's never been done before and it will never be done again. And some of us need to stand up and take a stand on that. Some of us need to speak into our situations and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a tough spot. I, I lost my job or I'm looking for a job and doors ain't opening. But, but the, I know, I think they're going to keep opening. But God, why aren't you opening doors? Listen, we need to speak it. Listen, I, I want you to tell you, I want you to say, Satan, be gone from this situation because I proclaim Jesus and I proclaim victory over this situation that I'm in. Our world's in a mess today. And what do we do? We go straight to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we want to just complain and whine. Listen, begin to speak authority over that. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you do something, God. Do something. We're beckoning on your name. God, it's time that you step in to intervene. We're tired of sitting around and just complaining. We all know that we're in a mess. But in the name of Jesus, I, I, God, I ask that you rise someone up to lead it. We have to begin to know the authority that God has given us in our life and know who the authority holder is. Jesus is right here as we looked in this passage. And he goes and he's baptized and God says, you ain't done nothing yet. But before you go and you get into this big mess you're fixing to get in, and before we defeat the devil again, I want you to know that you're mine. And knowing when you know that you're mine, you're not going to go through this alone. And then when you get to the other side, I want you to tell everybody about what we did, about what I did to get you through this situation. And I want you to start sharing your testimony about what God did. Have you ever noticed too many times when we get to the lowest of our lows, we're always like, oh, help me, Jesus. But when we start to hit the pinnacle and we are released from that situation, it's like, man, it was good. Oh, yeah, I, I was good. I fought through that. And we never give him the credit he deserves. And we wonder why we get in the situations that we get in. I want to say his time is due today. And I, I want to tell you this today. Is, is If you don't know him, you're in a bad situation. You're in a mess. Listen, in here speaking about Marsh Madness isn't the worst thing that's going to happen. Because I, I know God's going to get me through it. But I love my wife with all my heart. But she can't get me through every situation. My mom and daddy can't save me in every situation. But God said he would never leave me nor ever forsake me. And that when I sp speak the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Hey, can I tell you today, I don't know how you walked in here. I know we all have messes and garbage in our lives. Every one of us in here has something. But can I tell you that today, you need to leave here proclaiming the name of Jesus and leave here proclaiming victory in your life and in your situation? Listen, if we're going to go through this month of March Madness and, and if we're going to start to live out the vision that God gave us, then we, we have to start proclaiming Him. He's a big deal. He's the one, he's the only. It, he's the, like we said last week, the Bible starts off like that. It says, in the beginning, God. He's the beginning, he's the end, and he's everything in between. I'm going to ask Billy to come play this morning. And as Billy plays, I, I want to ask you, maybe this morning you, 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 need to, you need to start proclaiming victory right there in your seat this morning over some situation in your life. Maybe... Maybe this morning you need to come lay it down at the altar and say, Jesus, you, you take that wilderness back. I don't know what it looks like for you, but I know we all have something. And I know, I know we have to start being a little more bold about it. C could you imagine that day? Could you imagine that day Jesus coming up out of the water and even just standing as a bystander? And hearing a voice from heaven saying, huh, that's my boy. And with you, I am well pleased. Hey, hey, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? This morning, Jesus is saying, hey, you're mine. You're my son. You're my daughter. And, and today, I want you to know it's with you who I am well pleased. We got to own that. That's something we got to start owning.
Listen, my God's proud of me. I, I might not, not let an evangelistic conference across the United States, and, and I might not have all this credentials or something, but my God's proud of me because, because he ain't done with me yet. I haven't pushed my time clock. He's still got work to do with me. The question is, is will I let him? Will you let him today? I'm going to ask you if you'd stand with me. As Billy sings, I don't know what God's asking of you this morning. But I know he asks something of all of us. And too many times we, we do, we let Satan defeat us right there in our chairs in our church. Hey, I, I, I'm saying this in the name of Jesus. There's no more defeat in this place this morning. I, I pray that people leave here differently. They, they realize that they're not alone. You're not by yourself. Grab that authority and leave here with that. Leave here bold. 